idea what the expectations are or what to do. Fear not, <laughs> for that info is coming. Just keep working on your work, and that's it. But uh, real quick, I want to let you guys in on the best kept secret in all of Portland. <laughs> and a secret project that that best kept secret is working on. And that best kept secret is Max. And Max has some exciting stuff to share with you guys. Come on over here, Max. Talk for Max. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I know a lot of you, and I hope to know all of you soon. Next Wednesday, which is the 15th, from 6 to 8.30, we're gonna be showing a movie and having a raffle. And we're gonna be raffling off prints from Rory Phillips, who's a professor here who I've taken classes from and some of you take, have classes with. Jason Sturgeo, Alex Despain, um, by Olympia is donated some prints, We Make is donated prints and paper. The Pressure is donated prints, t-shirts and pins. Will Bryant's donating stuff. Kate is donating books and prints and other fun stuff. And what might be the big ticket item of the night are print credits used. <laughs> yeah, see, Ed, like, you mentioned print credits and everyone goes nuts. So <laughs> tickets are selling for a dollar a piece or five dollars for six. And I'll be floating around here after, and you can buy those for me. We're also selling them at the event. There will be pizza and Bev and popcorn. And it's gonna be fun, and I'll be there. And what's happening with all his money? Are you just? It's all. I'm car? pocketing it all. You guys, you're paying my tuition this term. Um, all of it's going to be honest to make it extra fun and special, so we have a little extra cushion money for where's, stuff. Where's it gonna be? It'll be here in 320, and we'll have the movie up here. And what's the movie gonna be? It's gonna be. Um, <laughs> Just Like Being There, which is a movie about screen printing gig posters, and it's awesome. Has anybody so, seen it already? Yeah, wait, cool. Oh, she said, she I thought, said yeah, would you, would, you, for a would you watch it again? Would you watch it for the first time again? <laughs> there we go, crowd endorsement by how big the is. So everyone be here. Thank you. Thank you, Max. <laughs> Max organized this all by himself. He contacted all those people to get all these items. He ran all over town and picked them up all on his own. He's a one-man, bowl-cutted wrecking crew. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Max. I think that's it. Again, um, if you have the honest money, you can give it to me after this. Or also be in this room from 2 to 5 if you need to drop it off. And today's the last day. We've had a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of people apply for Be Honest. So forgetting to pay your $10 is a great way to take some stress out of my life. <laughs> but it would also be really great if you paid it, because it's going to be a lot of fun if we all participate. Anything else to share from anybody? Anybody got cool stuff going on that we should know about? No? OK, cool. Mary Kate, are you ready to talk to these fools? I am. <laughs> all right, cool. Let me just introduce you real fast, and then they're all yours. Mary Kate McDevitt is a letterer and illustrator living and working in Brooklyn, New York. She graduated from Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia with a degree in graphic design and illustration. After working as a designer in a studio in Lancaster, Pennsylvania for two years, Mary Kate moved to Portland. Or, or Oregon to pursue a career as a freelance illustrator and artist. When Mary Kate's not in the studio, she enjoys drinking coffee, thrifting, riding bikes, watching news radio with her boyfriend, and redecorating her apartment. Let's welcome her, Mary Kate McDevitt. Um, hi, everyone. I just want to show you this drawing I made real quick. <laughs> Hello. Oh, it's all backwards, probably. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I'm an illustrator and letter, and I like kind of, even though I mostly do lettering, I like introducing myself like that because what I do is illustrate letters. Um, I'm not a typographer. I'm not a calligrapher. 
So I grew up outside of Philly, which I am now actually living in Philly again. I just moved like weeks ago and I'm in my makeshift studio here. Uh, I just put this like stuff up to look good because it was like covered in pieces of drywall and stuff because we're renovating a house, which is crazy. Um, so I went to school at Tyler School of Art uh, in Philadelphia and I graduated in 2007 and I st uh, majored in graphic design. And when I was working on my projects, I never really felt like I was getting the kind of style I was supposed to be working in. So I was uh, presenting my sketches and then going to final with them and suddenly like, they just like sucked all the life out of it. I just like wasn't getting getting like my style together. And my professors were like, why don't you illustrate your lettering? Why don't you illustrate your type? And I was like, oh, okay. I hadn't really thought of that. So I was um, starting to introduce lettering into my design projects. And that's kind of how I got started. And I'm going to quick go to my slideshow now. <laughs> um, if I could do that. Okay. I'll just click to the next one. Let's see. Is that, okay. So this is an example of one of my projects in design school where um, I re-illustrated one of my favorite children's books uh, grow up that I had really liked growing up called Streganona. Uh, I drew a lot of pasta and a lot of lettering, and this was kind of my first project where I really dove in like head first into this kind of uh, work. But when I graduated, I had this very illustration centric portfolio. And if I did use a font, it was customized in a way and had texture all over it. And I thought, who the hell is going to hire me with all this work trying to get like a professional design studio job? Uh, so when I graduated, I decided to just go for illustration. So I was doing um, illustration work when I graduated, but I ended up getting called in for an interview at a design studio. And I was like, well, I'm certainly in no, you know, standing to turn down any kind of work whatsoever. So I decided to go in for the interview and I actually ended up getting the job. But I found myself shortly after working there that I was running into the same kind of issues I had when I was a sophomore in design school, just like trying to do this work that really didn't feel like my style or my own. So outside of uh, work, I started painting these chalkboards that I called mini goals chalkboards. And I opened up an Etsy shop and I just kind of wanted to do something around the idea of uh, getting things done and uh, being able to do lettering. Because at the time, you know, I had a full-time job for the first time in my life. And I was getting home and I was like, how does anyone get anything done? The banks close at five, I'm exhausted by Friday, and I don't even like cooking. So these chalkboards were something I made for myself and my friends to take the today's, you know, the day's to-do list into small tasks. So I was making a ton of these chalkboards and just kind of coming up with fun ideas for them. Uh, I usually never show these in slide uh, presentations because I just never took a good picture of them, but they're still kind of fun. Um, so this is the chalkboard I had in my apartment um, in like 2007 and my rent was incredibly cheap and we had really pathetic grocery list of coffee and bread. <laughs> um, but it, this is what sparked the idea for the chalkboards. Um, Mary, some of I don't think your slides are clicking through. Oh, oh okay, I'm sorry, whoops. Here we go. I'm there. sorry. Here the. Oh, yeah, we got it. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> okay. Um. So this is the chalkboard from my apartment that really uh, inspired the idea. Um. So I was making these chalkboards, and these are all from like 2007 to 2011 ish, and I was still working at uh the design studio I was at in Lancaster. And I was spending a lot of time after work painting these and posting them on blogs. And I ended up getting 
featured on a couple um, like Design Sponge and Design Work Life and this blog called Drawn. And I ended up getting an email from an art director at Chronicle Books uh, who asked to make these chalkboards into a notepad. And I was like, okay, yeah, like that's amazing. So that next day, I kind of told my boss about it. And he had a different take on what qualified as uh, you know, a non-compete situation. I was like, I'm hand painting these chalkboards in my own time. And I think he thought that I should have brought that idea to the design studio. And we were like, we were doing flooring catalogs and like e-blasts. And I was like, okay, this clearly is not the place for me. So it was around that time and that I decided it's, it's, I should just switch to freelance. And I figured, you know, I only have one client right now, but Chronicle Books is a pretty decent way to start. <coughs> so not long after that email from Chronicle Books, I, I decided to switch to freelance. And I figured, you know, the best way to do that is to just like move to Portland. I have like no job experience whatsoever and just want to start being an artist. So moving to Portland is the obvious obvious way to go in that. Um, so I continue to work with Chronicle Books and uh, this is a, a project just kind of under the same realm of like getting things done and just kind of like kind of making fun of being motivated <laughs> um, but also helpful. And my hand lettering ledger books uh, that I, I published with Chronicle Books. So these chalkboards were a really good introduction to my illustration career, because I was making these one-off chalkboards and coming up with new phrases to use, because I was really getting sick of making the same ones over and over again. I've, I, I was going through my old Flickr page, which is also like, you know, who uses Flickr anymore? But, uh, and I just got to see like how many I made, and it was kind of like, I can't believe I spent so much time painting on these tiny little chalkboards. And I, I was using um, like a pen and nib. And it's like, you know nails on a chalkboard? Drawing on a chalkboard, it's, it was literally like drawing nails on a chalkboard. It was like very, it irked me out. And I would have to like water down the slate to clean it. It was not uh, pleasant, but it was still really fun. So, but what I kind of realized is that I sh probably should have been working more like a calligrapher rather than a letterer because calligraphers could have like shot through this project really quickly. Because uh, lettering, sorry, lettering is drawn and calligraphy is written. So calligraphers use one smooth stroke uh, that's been perfected through muscle memory to kind of like nail each stroke each time where lettering it's drawn and kind of venessed to the point where you know it's just completely drawn like even my example of calligraphy is a calligraphy like i kind of added in those thick strokes where you see them so so when i was making the chalkboards i was using a pen and nib with one shot paint which is kind of which is what sign painters used uh with a little bit of turpenoid to water it down so it was more like an inconsistency so for a while, all my lettering was done with these pen and nibs and like uh, calligraphy pens because I thought that's what letters were supposed to use because I, I didn't know any better. But I, when I started getting more lettering assignments for clients, I was using these pen and nibs and calligraphy pens and it was just very frustrating to work with because, you know, the ink would suddenly blob on the page and it just wasn't, it was really hard to get a consistent line, especially when you're drawing very slowly, you're just like trying to be perfect about it and I'm not a calligrapher. So I've since um, simplified my drawing school, my drawing tools a bit. Uh, so the top there is a black wing pencil. It's for my serious like RTG sketching, like ready to go. Um, it's like a really dark line, like a, a soft pencil. Um, the Graph Gear 500, 
this is like for lightweight sketching. It's just like a fancy mechanical pencil, which I still use those uh, as well. And then below that is just a sign pen. It's a super cheap uh, marker, just a fine tip marker that I just, I end up drawing with this like so often, particularly when I'm like, a, when I want a bit of a texture. And below that is my Uniball pen. And the Uniball pen is what I use for 98% of my inking. I basically use it for everything. And then a small ruler for guides and stuff. I also use a compass. And when people see this on my desk and ha ask how it's used in my process, it's really just for slight curves. It's not technical at all. So if you see something, and I'm uh, talking with my hands so you can't see me, but when you see something that, that's mine and it's kind of like on an arc, it's because I just drew that with a compass. It's nothing super technical. Um, I think this kind of misconception about lettering being super technical and like having all these specific tools comes from people who post those, you know, Instagrams of lettering with like circles and diagrams on it to like show how the serifs line up in a certain way. Like you're drawing the Vitruvian man, but it's like, it's not how it works. It's like lettering is, it's all just very, it comes together more organically than that. It's built up slowly. Um, so this is my collection of gel pens. I've been using a lot more gel pens lately because they're super fun. Um, and I really like gel pens because they kind of have this, they have a matte quality like gouache, but much cheaper and easier to use. And it's like a pen, so it's like, you could bring it anywhere. So. I've been uh, doing a lot of gel pen work in my sketchbooks and these are just like when I'm you know in the middle of a phone call or something I'm just like constantly drawing little things the quote on the right is from a show called peep show I'm like a I'm definitely like a TV junkie I'll I'm always watching TV at some point so I'm always uh, drawing quotes from TV so this is from peep show um, more gel pen drawing. This is gel pen and acrylic, mixed media. Gel pens, you know, to make the gel pen seem fancier. <laughs> so these are my black wing pencils. So I was first introduced to black wing pencils in Portland at a shop called Hand Eye Supply, um, which is, you know, one of those places, you, you go shopping at Hand Eye Supply if you really want to look like you're a serious maker. You can get like workwear, workwear gear, like a full-on overall thing, and like cool contractor pencils and stuff. So anyway, I was shopping there, picking up some random things, and I was looking at these pencils. And uh, Tobias, who works there, was like, "Oh, these pencils, like they were they stopped production in the '90s, and they're made out of California cedar. People were like hoarding boxes and buying them on eBay for like a hundred dollars. And they just started remaking them that year. It was like 2010 or something. And of course, I was sold because anyone knows, like in retail, like a good story will basically sell you on anything. But as far as pencils go, it's pretty easy to sell pencils to a designer, especially when there's like a cool like flat eraser and they're black and there's like gold detail. Um, <laughs> But I, I like black wing pencils. They're really fun. So this is the sketchbook I use. I, it's When people ask me what sketchbook I use, I don't know what to call this. Do I call this Super Deluxe? I, I use Super Deluxe Sketchbook. I don't know. It, it has a tag right there. It says, the only sketchbook you will ever need. So that's basically how I buy things. I'm just like, oh, is this good? And they're like, yeah, it says it right there on the cover. <laughs> Um, but for all my sketching and stuff, I use uh, like a big moleskin or like a lectern sketchbook, something like that. Um, big, like nine by 12 sketchbooks, because this fits all my notes, all my client sketches, all my doodles, and all my other random like notes that I, could, uh, that I keep. I used to collect a lot of small sketchbooks, and they either ended up all doodles or just like all like, you know, Home Depot trip list making. And I would never like filled an entire one, but since I've got the big ones, I, I tend to use them a lot more because uh, 
I like sketching a little bigger. So I use this all for my a lot of my client sketches too. And what I like about these sketchbooks is the thin paper. It can kind of be used for tracing paper because uh, the way I do sketches, and I'll show you in a bit, it's good. It's a good way to like you do a light sketch, put a sheet of paper, put a piece of paper on top of it, and just kind of like build it up from there. So this is uh, my light pad, and I don't know if anyone else is like bought a new light pad recently but like I used to have one that was like a huge light box you call them now they're called light pads but it had like two fluorescent bulbs in it and it just like you could never get a good light consistency and it ha I had to store it on a shelf and stuff so this one's great because I could like I, it's just on my desk at all times and it's like I use it to eat lunch off of and <laughs> sketch and stuff but you know, it cleans up nice, like don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so I take my sketches, and sometimes I'll take my rough sketches, put a piece of paper on top, and then finesse from there. But this is basically what I use when I have my final revised drawing. I put it on the light pad, and uh, I take some super deluxe paper, and I draw on top of that um, and ink it. So the other stuff I use. So this is a, kind of in the order that I use everything the, for the software and hardware I use, the Artograph Light Pad. And then I scan everything in a Canon, CanoScan LIDE700F. Um, scanners are like, I, I think they're becoming obsolete. I get people asking me all the time about which scanners I recommend. And I recommend this one and I haven't actually checked, but someone was like, oh, it's like super expensive now, or I can't find it. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe it's 800F now. I have no idea. But they're just not making scanners like they used to. So I'm going to hoard this for like the rest of my life. But the reason I like this one is because it has a, it, it has a, it doesn't have a lip on the end. So the top just kind of bleeds off. So when you place your sketchbook down, especially if you're using bigger sketchbooks like I do, it doesn't create a shadow when you're scanning it. Uh, I use Illustrator CSF, I mean CS5, sorry. Um, I use CS5 because, which I'll explain later, but I refuse to upgrade. Um, I've recently started using a Cintiq. Uh, I use it for Photoshop brushes and stuff, because um, I'm sure, er Unless you haven't, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Kyle T. Webster's brushes. They're amazing. That's probably the only reason I bought this thing, too, because I've seen people, like, using these brushes, and they're amazing. Uh, but I still use it only for, like, final coloring work. I still draw everything by hand, mainly because I kind of can't see how to fit everything on that screen and how to look everything at the same time. I find a very, I still find it very strange to draw on. But I used to say like, oh, I would never use a Wacom or whatever. And now it's like, ah, uh, your process changes. You have to kind of just go with the flow. I can't like, which is why, like again, like I'll probably upgrade from CS5 and you know, a year from now I'll be like, I can't believe I was such a stubborn jerk about CS6 or whatever it is now. But anyway, uh, and a laser printer. I use laser printers. I just Every time I draw something and it needs to be revised, I print it out, redraw that thing. I also print a lot of stuff after I draw it for revisions and just like kind of double checking everything. So, um, so I drew this when I got a new fancy pencil, probably the graph 500 whatever that pencil's called and I was just excited to test it out and I just kind of decided to draw this little phrase and basically you could be using the most awesome pencil ever but if you're not using it you're not gonna get better so what I really love about shopping for art supplies other than the fact that it's like one of my favorite things to do ever is that when you get home you're excited to test it out so I, I do think like, uh, you know, new pencils means better drawings, but really just means more drawings mean better drawings. You could just be using a fresh box of Dixon num number twos and you're going to get better just by, by using those as well. 
so this is my a breakdown of my process. Um, you know, it's pretty simple. I guess it's kind of obvious, but I do tend to think people rush into the final rather than taking each step slowly. If you build up with this slower process, it gives you time to find mistakes or cleaning up the drawing or just slowly building it rather than rushing into just making some Instagrammable drawing. So brainstorming, you know, list making and reference and just kind of collecting words and ideas. Um, inspiration, they're images for the concept. Um, I generally think, you know, we're all looking for inspiration at any moment of the day, but sometimes when you're looking for a specific project that has a specific kind of look or you're trying to reference something, a specific, specific time period, really important thumbnails a bunch of small sketches just like you know there it's a super important step but people tend to skip it to uh, sketch a tighter sketch something as you know you pick a couple of your thumbnails that you like and then a refined sketch an even tighter sketch this is the one that you show to the client not necessarily the just like sketch that you finished up you have to kind of draw it again because each time you draw it your drawing is going to get better um, final link drawing that's ready to scan and color and texture and you're always critiquing after each step too just kind of taking a step back is important so this is a an example of whoa <laughs> sorry I have no idea what happened there let's see pick a okay okay this is an example of uh, some brainstorming I did. I just wrote a bunch of words that relate to the project. This brainstorming session is kind of half writing and half doodling because I'm more visually inspired than words, but you know, really whatever works for you. This is just a time to make connections. So just because lettering is often labeled as decorative doesn't mean there isn't a concept to it. When I'm writing words, sometimes I'm being more descriptive and there are styles of words that have a, you know, that have a bright look versus a dark look. Like I say, when you're writing a brainstorming list, you should just uh, write as whatever comes to you. So for this project, I was asked to design a T-shirt for Minecraft, which is a game, video game, and I could do whatever I wanted. I was like, okay, great. Uh, I don't know anything about Minecraft or video games, so. <laughs> To get ideas for this project, I actually watched a bunch of YouTube videos of people playing that game because I guess that's a thing. Because <laughs> I was like, well, I, there, you know, there is such thing as a deadline. I don't have time to learn this new video game and get good at it. Because um, I was actually never really into video games myself, but I do like watching people just like having fun playing video games. I have no problem with that. So. Uh, so for this particular t-shirt, I came to this YouTube video that was titled, The Best Way to Find Diamonds in Minecraft! Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. And I was like, I really came up, I, I really like this idea of uh, all mine and like collecting diamonds. So, and uh, they wanted this t-shirt to be, you know, they use the term girly, but I, I, I mean, I understand what that means, but, so I really wanted it to have this idea of uh, collecting diamonds and kind of the thrill of finding a diamond. So this is the sketch and this is the final for the t-shirt um, because I, or just what I found just from m watching people play Minecraft, just how excited what excited people were to play, or uh, I mean to find diamonds, so. And this is the t-shirt. Um, <laughs> I could never wear this t-shirt because I just find scoop necks very unflattering on myself, but <laughs> it looks good in it, but I can't forget it. So this is just a, this is a quote I did. Again, this is from a episode of The Simpsons. It's a Ned Flanderism, <laughs> if you're familiar. Um, it was, a, I had like just marathoned all of season, I don't know, like, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 12. <laughs> and it was also October, and I had just gone to an apple farm, um, and I had a little bit of time, so uh, make this print. 
So I'm kind of always seeking information and inspiration all the time. I collect a lot of stuff and I use my walls as a little Pinterest board. So I was putting this uh, together and I was choosing color palettes and I vectorize everything. So I'm choosing color palettes in Illustrator. I think it's a lot easier to do it like that. But I was working in all these like ochre and just yellow color palettes and someone was like, someone made the connection that they thought they were, uh, they were talking about P or something. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't want that. That's not what I'm going for. So I wanted it to be more colorful. So I look up at my desk and I was like, well, that's the color palette I want. That's what I saw at the Apple Farm. So when I finished the print, I just put it up on my shelf and I was like, yeah, it's my color palette is just right in front of me. Whenever I have trouble putting colors together, it's like, uh, just look around at your, your favorite colors all, and it'll come together. So some basic tips to keep in mind about lettering is really just that letters are just made out of shapes. I think people get a little, um, drawing letters can be a little daunting because you think you have to be working on like a font or something. Like you need to be drawing letters perfect, like some typeface. But really, they're just made out of shapes. And once you have the framework down, which is step one, draw the frame of the letter. You know, we've all done that, that's easy. Number two, you add weight to the letter. And you know, in this case, it's just like very simple, even weighted, uh, just rectangles. Number three, you add some style details to the letter. Number four, finishing touches. And really it's like, if you just break it down like that, that it'll become a lot easier. I mean, imagine decorating a room from the ground up. And this is like, because I just bought a house and I'm all about decorating. But how tall the ceilings are, how big the window is, and if like the ceiling is curved, if what the hallway, if it's a hallway, that's the framework that sets the tone for how the rest of the room is, will look. You Then you add flooring and furniture and art and window finishings. You don't buy a couch before you have a room to put it in. You ever see those like house hunters with their frustrated realtors finding a house based around someone's couch? It's crazy town. <laughs> so this is an exercise um, to try if you're in a lettering kind of shape rut. Uh, just experimenting with new styles to take you out of your comfort zone. So this is just an example from my Skillshare class, actually, um, where you take a word from your brainstorm list or whatever the word is you're drawing or whatever, it, uh, just a word, an important word from your quote, and just draw it in as many st styles as possible. So here I have script, fancy serif, which isn't a thing. It's just like I had to call it something. In a shape, that's when you know, the letters take the form of the shape. Ornate, serif, on a curve, black letter, sans serif, and representational. And as you can see here, I just went with lightning bolt theme. And um, on the, the one that's on a curve, it I can't stand that drawing. Like it bothers, every time I see it, I just like, ugh, I hate it. Because I didn't use a compass actually, I just kind of like roughed it in. And when you look at it, it looks like flectric. Like that, it doesn't look like an E. And like, it's just, it's one of those things where it's like you have to go back in and kind of finesse it. And it's like, it, the C looks like it's on more of an angle than the E looks a little bit more straight up. But uh, I kept it in because, you know, it's, you know, everyone kind of makes these errors. And as long as you're seeing them, that's really what's important. And that what's, that's what makes you a better drawer. So this is uh, when I start a sketch. So the sketch on the left is basically just a, like a more realized sketch based on a thumbnail. So this is like the sketch where I just kind of put everything together. I'm figuring out spacing and I'm kind of like considering what kind of details I'm gonna be adding later. Um, I remember in like drawing and painting classes, we were always told to work the whole canvas at the same time. We would lay out large areas of watery paint to put down the figure or whatever you're drawing and get the whole composition in. If you were to just start painting the head, if you know, figure painting, you would have this crazy out of proportion body that wasn't done on purpose. You know, same thing with lettering. 
lettering. So I start sketching and I say, say I do want something out of proportion, it still needs to have a sense of purpose and still fit in with the rest of his little letter buddies. So I never like really just work focus on one letter at one time because then you're going to run into the issue of, you know, it not fitting or it just like the sizing changes and it just looks wrong rather than on purpose. So at this stage, I'm just drawing the frame of the letters, just the bones, but leaving just room to add weight to the letter. So the one on the right, now that, uh, and this is when I use my light pad, or if I'm working in my sketchbook, I'll just put another piece of thin paper on top and you can just see, you know, the framework of the lettering. And this is when I'll start kind of making some more decisions and being like, what, how, what kind of weight I want and what kind of styles I want on each word. And here is the ink drawing is on the left. And I think that I'm actually not sure if that's vectorized or inked, but when I do scan in an ink drawing, I like for it to be as close to the final as possible because when I'm inking, I'm not making any decisions about what the letter forms look like. That's why I think a, a refined sketch is so important because, you know, when you're inking, that's when I can turn on law and order and zone out and just like draw rather than being like, oh shit, I have to like change this or like I need to start working on another drawing. This is when I'm like just making sure I have a nice clean dark drawing so I can scan in and everything will go smoothly from there. So uh, the one on the right is the final and uh, I chose all the colors in Illustrator too. I just find it much simpler and easier to kind of like test out different color composition, tele, uh, color palettes and everything and put it together that way. And then I bring everything in Photoshop and add texture. And I'll show you how I do live trace. So I know probably everyone there uses the, I don't know, CS6 or the Creative Cloud, but this is CS5. And when you do look at like Creative Cloud or CS6, it looks so much fancier. Illustrator CS5 looks like way old school software program, but it works for me, so I don't know. So let's see. So you go to Object Live Trace, and then you go to Tracing Options, and this is where I think people uh, make their mistakes when they're live tracing their lettering, is they just choose default, and that's when you kind of end up with some wonky looking lettering, um, and it doesn't have that that had nice crunchy texture that it's supposed to have. Because I do leave the crunchy texture in there. I'm not, I don't go in and retrace things. And these are the things that are important. Just kind of working with the threshold, the path fitting, all these things, and always ignore white. Ignore white, you just like you end up with all these white shapes that you just have to delete in the end. But also in CS5, and this is why I choose to stick with CS5, it has a lettering option. And I use it all the time, actually, because it actually works quite well. So I use the lettering option. This is a, a drawing that I scanned in. And here on the left are two. These are two options of them actually live trace. And you can see on the right uh, the crazy amount of points, just like a million points. But this is, you, you know, you can also live trace with texture. and. Illustrator. And this was for a cover of Variety magazine, which they kind of, uh, they decided to change it up a little bit at the end, but I like the cover. And then this is how I add texture in Photoshop. So I bring in a photo, uh, you know, some kind of texture, and then I place my art on top. And then I'll, I, well, then I put down a texture on top of my vector image and then I just create a clipping mask and I have a texture inside the lettering and I know a lot of you guys probably know that but it took me forever to figure out this kind of stuff uh, and then I you know I'll add a bunch of textures from there this is an example of something that I would scan in um, so and this is a another quote from a TV show I must seem like a crazy person who just is a shut-in and only watches TV 24-7 which is just partially true. So this is a quote from news radio. And uh, anyway, as you can see, 
Uh, not like I don't fill in all the letters if they don't have to be, or especially if they have um, some inline details, because then I don't have to use another layer of uh, inked drawings to kind of piece together in the computer. And then I have a rose detail that I was going to have in the end, and, which I just drew to off in the corner, which I can just put together in the computer. But the reason I can also have an ink drawing like this is because I have a nice refined sketch to work off of. I don't know if I have the... So I, I know like everything's going to fit together fine. I can piece it together quite easily. And this is what it looked like. Just kind of finished. And I ended up adding and changing a few things too. Let's see. Um, so this is a project I did recently. These are sketches from my visit with the American Museum of Natural History, a few shops, and the shop I run with my boyfriend, Winter Cabin Collection, were invited for a behind the scenes tour to create a special product for the museum's gift shop, which is pretty cool and basically like my fifth grade dream, which is why I look like a fifth grader, this picture, all like ready to go learning. <laughs> so this project had a really tight deadline. So we knew like, well, there's no way we're going to say no because we were really excited to be asked. But we also knew we wanted to nail down the idea while we were there. I'm not really one to have a traveling sketchbook. Like I'm not always just like pulling it out and drawing it whenever I feel inspired. But I must say, I felt like a real artist walking down the halls of the research facilities with a sketchbook in hand, just like drawing while listening to someone talk. And uh, I basically just like filled as many pages I could possibly do. And I mean, it took all day to be there, but we were only there for a few short hours. So we got to see some rare books and a bunch of dead birds. It was really cool. <laughs> so this, so uh, during a break, um, we had some cocktails because <laughs> it was such a long day. Uh, me and Fred had some cocktails and we were discussing what we we're going to do. And Fred specializes in printing bandanas. So we knew, well, you know, like, let's make a bandana because I think it makes sense for the museum. It feels very adventure -y, like, you know, Indiana Jones would probably have a bandana. So we came across this Roosevelt quote, which I thought captured the essence of the museum very well. And uh, we basically just roughed out this sketch while we were there, just like looking at some of the sketches I collected and the quote and everything. And um, the only kind of thumbnails we did were just uh, different kind of variations on the how the bandana would be blocked out. The bandanas that we've done in the past all had a circle in the background, like right in the middle. So we knew we didn't want to do that. So this time we did a diamond, really changing things up. <laughs> And this is my revised drawing. And this drawing is on my super deluxe paper, which is really toothy. I never do pencil drawings on that paper because it just smudges all the time and it drives me crazy. But I wanted to start, I wanted to work as big as possible. So this drawing is 13 by 13, which isn't that big, but I, you know, I usually work like eight by eight or nine by nine. So it was bigger than um, how I usually work. And this wasn't for a client, so it didn't really have to be that super tight. It just had to be tight enough for me to take it and ink it up. So this is the ink drawing. And at one point, I messed up the quote. <laughs> uh, so you'll see a shift in the quote, but, you know, no one has to know other than you guys and anyone else who's watching. So this is the, ink, the uh, drawing inked up and pieced together in Photoshop. And then here it is live traced so like I, tr I just tried to make the ink drawing as tight as possible because I knew I didn't really want to make that many edits and I didn't really have that much time but the things I left out were like I was kind of working with two different border options um, seeing what I would like best in the final and the corner details I knew I could just kind of duplicate those and this is the sep the uh, what I sent to Fred to print um, for him to put together on the screen and everything. And here it is finished, printed on a bandana. And here's Fred printing, just to let you know, it's all like, all handmade. 
So even though this project had a more spontaneous sort of feel, just, I mean, not that spontaneous. We did have a few weeks to work on it, not like a couple of days, not like Project Runway style, but uh, <laughs> it's still pretty like quick. Uh, but I still applied my basic process. I was doing brainstorming, collecting inspiration, doing a thumbnail, sketch, revise sketch, and ink drawing. You know, just because a project has a shorter deadline doesn't necessarily mean you need to skip every step. You just need to revise them and make them work for that particular project. This was a project that I worked a bit differently, for sure. So this is an invitation for a friend's daughter. I basically gave myself a few hours to do it because I was actually sort of swamped. But there's nothing like taking on a fun project that goes from like nothing to complete super fast to get your confidence back up. Just like, you know, you're working on a project that's taking months to come together and you're just like, I just want to finish a project from like A to B, like for real. So for this, uh, I just did this one sketch. And as far as clients go, you know, one year old people are pretty lenient. So I knew she wasn't gonna like fuss too much if I didn't have like three distinct sketches to present. So the final sketch I actually showed them uh, is the pencil sketch that I used for the final. I actually took this sketch and I just, I just made sure to do like a nice dark pencil drawing uh, using like the black wing pencil. And I scanned it in and that's what I used for my final ink drawing. And I really kind of like this process because I really liked just how kind of loose it was. And it looked like, you know, maybe drawn with a crayon or something. Like Mila could have drawn it, even though, pff, <laughs> I don't think so, Mila. <laughs> I'm just kidding. She's talented. So there was only uh, one color change because Mila decided her new favorite color was purple, not pink. But I still like the pink. I think the pink looks better. So... So this is a, I always like making art for my friends and family because if it, if I have time and it sounds fun, why not? You know, it, the chances, to, the time you do free art is when it's for people you love, you know? So I make a Christmas card every year for my dad who gives it to his clients. He's a fi financial advisor. So his clients definitely appreciate hand lettered Christmas cards, I'm sure. So this is one I made in 2011. And a couple of years ago, I was approached by Target to make a gift card inspired by this design because I posted it on Dribble or something. And so I sent Target these other options along with kind of a revised sketch of the card I did for my dad because no one really likes doing the same art they just did a year later. It's just like, oh, God, why am I still working on this same drawing? Nightmare. <laughs> so I just kind of presented other sketches that had kind of a similar feeling. And they actually ended up going with the one in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and this is the final. Overall, I think my dad was pleased to go kick a client to me. I don't even think he realized how excited I was to get approached by Target. He was like, yeah, good, good, good job. <laughs> <laughs> So I do a lot of personal work that I post on Instagram or my blog or whatever because it's usually the work I get to do and try something new and have fun with, like my dad's Christmas card or Mila's birthday invitation. So this is a tiny sketch I did when I lived in Portland. And it was a particularly hot day. You know, we don't get a lot of those in Portland, but just enough to complain about it a little bit. But... Uh, <laughs> I should have a dime in here for size because this sketch is so super tiny, but I'm glad I was able to find it in a sketchbook. Um, I have weird doodles like this all over my sketchbook. People would probably think I'm nuts if they were to go through it. But anyway, the next day after I did this sketch, it cooled off enough to make the studio more tolerable. Uh, no AC in my studio in Portland, but um, you really don't need AC, so it really wasn't that big of a deal. So anyway, it was a little cooler the next day so I decided to ink it up and add color and bring this hot shit popsicle to life <laughs> and I just had like a lot of fun making this drawing and just kind of like having this one random small idea kind of come 
to color and have more fun to it. So I posted on Instagram and I was approached by an agency who wanted to kind of create the same kind of characters for a food packaging, uh, frozen food packaging. <laughs> so they, they wanted to have like, they had me do a lot of like copywriting and like character development because of this hot shit popsicle. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a character developer, but sure. And basically this shrimp is like my favorite thing I've ever drawn in my life. I just, <laughs> this little things just kill me. Um, so even though these, the, pa the illustrations ended up not getting picked for the packaging, which happens a lot in uh, advertising or, you know, agency work because they pitched it to the client, but they did end up using the illustrations on a truck. So I got to do all the truck graphics and I came up with all the copywriting. I think they thought like hiring a letterer meant you're also hiring a copywriter because they were like, yeah, like come up with sayings to put on the truck. And I was like, okay, like I have a pretty cheesy, uh, pretty cheesy humor. So it's like yeah. cook food, burn rubber, fueled by flavor. Like, so, uh, but I really liked drawing these kind of angry uh, treats. And it's something that I've just like been doing ever since. So like this past summer, <laughs> I've, you know, made more illustrations of sweet treats reacting to weather. <laughs> so I had this, uh, what would you call this kind of vanilla? It's like v fancy vanilla bean ice cream. Which is always my favorite, just being like, fuck off, <laughs> dragging his body in the summer heat. Uh, but I posted this on Instagram, and I think people had a little, like, a, a salty kind of reaction. So I wanted to liven things up a bit <laughs> with more summer vibes, uh, getting back to Whitney, the s'more in the fire, getting down to this one. So... I just like get a real kick out of drawing these kind of food related illustrations. So since then I've been doing it more for client work. I would, this is a, well, you guys know Brad um, in Portland. Yeah. He, I did this for snacks quarterly um, when snacks rule the grocery shopping list. Cause if you've ever gone, shopping with this, like, I'm going to get broccoli and I'm going to get carrots and lettuce and everything. And then you just walk down the snack item and like these like little popcorn burglars sneak up on your shoulder and like, no, get cookies instead. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've just been drawing snacks like crazy now. So this is for a client project that I'm working on currently. Um, and this is going to be animated, which would be fun to see, but it's actually like super in progress. And this is for the Baltimore magazine cover coming up this summer, which is also like a majorly sneak preview, I guess. Um, but also filled with a bunch of little critters, little snacks running around. So... I get a lot of projects, particularly with advertising, when the concept and everything has already been approved. This is a project I work on with Smuckers, and the brief was really tight. They had mocked up art that they did inspired by my work, and the, they said the client has already seen this and they're already on board, so we really just need you to tighten it up. So all the sketches I presented were very similar. The one on the upper left-hand corner is actually the wild card that they were like, yeah, okay, we we like the something different, but it's not like where we can't present it to the client, just like they get so uh, nervous about that kind of stuff. So it's just kind of um, interesting to just see these kind of projects with advertising. So the one on the left is the sketch I presented, and the one on the right is the final. And this is something I learned very quickly working with advertising clients is like, you know, you kind of have to take down, take your creativity down a notch and just kind of like use it towards something else, like making smart decisions about the readability and just like how the letters are formed to be fun, but not so fun. And what kind of little adjustments you can make from there. But I remember when I was working on this, 
I just changed one letter very slightly because I thought it looked a little weird. And they were like, oh, we need to go back to the E. The client already saw that E and it's already been approved. I'm like, well, it's just like, it just looks slightly better. So now I, when I work with advertising clients, I'm always very clear about what the final will actually be. So this is a bit, basically an idea of what I'm talking about. So this is a project I did for Barefoot Wine. This is not my work, by the way. This is So the client sent me this sketch. And they're like, we like this idea, but we want it to look good. And I was like, okay. And like, that's basically what designers were brought on to do. And I'm like, okay, well, this wine glass makes no sense. You can't, they're like, we also need to see the full bottle. And I was like, okay, interesting. You can only see like a 16th of the bottle or something. So. So you kind of have to get creative in that way. It's not like, it's not my idea. It's not my concept. So this is what I came up with. The one on the left was that for a particular bottle, uh, the quote for that, the Cabernet. So I kind of have to work with their idea, but make it work for something that I think looks good. So they really wanted the wine working with the lettering, spilling out, that whole thing. But I'm actually really excited about how these look. And uh, my mom loves barefoot wine. So when I told her I was working with barefoot wine, she was pretty excited. It's always nice to get a shout out from your parents, being proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, um, this is another project I worked on with an advertising company for Smart Ones. and. Uh, this is the, these are the uh, magazine ads that went pretty smoothly and I actually had a lot of fun working on these. These, they were a little more loose with like the art direction, uh, other than the every plate is a clean slate that had to have a very particular look, but the other ones were more playful. But what was so great about this project was that I was brought in a few months later to do a live drawing. Um, for Times Square billboards animation. So this was pretty fun. You can, it's really hard to get a sense of a lot of the work I did for this, um, but you can see in that wrinkly tent, there's a big chalkboard wall that I did um, all the lettering for. So the smart ones, it was basically about like confessing your, you know, food, bad food, uh, you know, whatever, your food confessions. So, um, the animations I did were on the Times Square billboard, which was really cool. And the confession booth, I got to illustrate the entire interior. And what was fun about that is um, they didn't want like a lot of lettering. They just wanted it to be kind of decorative. So I got to like decorate the room, which is actually pretty fun. I have like, I snuck my cat in there like three times. <laughs> so above is, so the above is the, confession that I drew live. So I was drawing all the confessions on a iPad and the below is uh, someone confessing. And I apologize if anyone knows this person for the screenshot I took of her. Not, I don't know. Um, and here's me drawing and I'm using like a stylus pen. I was, I bought a fancy stylus pen with like a really like fine tip that broke that morning. And my backup was like, basically like a pen that's like kind of like still like your finger shape and it's like so unsatisfying to draw with uh because i'm so used to have fine tip it's like drawing with like a piece of cloth like wrapped up it's like ridiculous so i was sitting on this like crazy black chair it's kind of weird but um i drew all these confessions and here's some of them were super long and i basically had 90 seconds to draw each one because they gave me their the confession the confession was told to me via a note card and i drew it and then i uploaded it to dropbox and some person like uploaded it to you know the times square billboard and here's just a, a couple of them that i got to illustrate um they wanted like some illustration. They wanted it to be as fun as possible, but I only had like 90 seconds to do each one, which is kind of long, especially Jennifer from Cananooga, New York with the long names and everything. That always irritated me. <laughs> it was like, 
<laughs> Can you not have a long name? <laughs> and here is, oops, sorry. I don't know how to press play. It's supposed to play something. Oh, this is a PDF. I'm sorry. Anyway, that, I was going to play one of the animations, but uh, it won't play. But that was a really fun project and definitely something different. So this one, this is a project I did um, for story publishing. It's I really like this cover. There's nothing particular about the project, but it's just an example that there's never a dull moment in freelance. I got an email from my art director. It was the final cover meeting, basically the final book meeting um, before it gets like, you know, finalized forever uh, with the editors and all the executives. And they almost wanted to change the title of the book and therefore change the design and direction of the cover. But apparently towards the end of this meeting, and I don't know how it all went, but the, one of the executives stood up, and this was told to me via my art director. The executive stood up and he said, if you change this cover, I will kill you all. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so, you know, needless to say, they are going forward with this direction. No one was murdered and everyone's still alive. And if you're interested in tomatoes, this is a really good book on tomatoes. But um, yeah, very interesting. Always comments like this make my day. But uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Hmm. So, wow. Hi, we have Mary Kate. It's okay. We have time for a couple quick questions. Mm -hmm. And if you come up and ask a question into the mic, I will give you a raffle ticket for next week. I'm just pushing my own event for all of you so aggressively. <laughs> so don't start a stampede. But does anybody want to come ask a question? Yeah, Eric. Over here. Raffle Good. You can stand right there. Hello. Uh, I was wondering where you got your light pad. Uh, Amazon. <laughs> and what? Amazon. Amazon. Okay, never mind. Uh, also, yeah. uh, I just really enjoy your lettering. I was just wondering if you would uh, care to tell me what got you interested in it in the beginning, like how, like how you started to letter, like what. Made you blossom um, it was basically when I was in design school and I was working on projects. It was basically just like doing these sketches that were looking better than my final projects. And when I was kind of just like sketching out where the lettering or the type would be, my professors were like, you should just draw it by hand. And I was like, okay. So it really was just out of like a way of incorporating my illustration with my design and um because when i was in school i didn't really know what if lettering was like a thing it was just like i was just thought i was just like hand drawn hand doing my design work so because i had a lot of texture and stuff in my design projects and so i was trying to like cram you know gill sands or something in this project that didn't make sense um so I, that's how i kind of just started drawing everything by hand to pick a sorry, one more question. To uh, pick a texture for your illustrations, how would you go about that? Like to pick the specific texture for it. Well, I think I'm always kind of going for this like almost painterly, just very subtle texture. Um, I like I've collected a lot of just like brushed kind of textures that I've scanned in. And I also use a lot of like Kyle T. Webster's brushes on Photoshop. But when I used to do a lot more illustration in school, I was doing everything in acrylic paint and a lot of like layers. So all the layers would have like these little like flecks of color from like different layers of colors on top of each other. So I'm always kind of going for that kind of look, just something kind of like, just like a little, just a little bit. I'm not trying to go for like rough or just like so, so like heavily like it looks like it was photocopied nothing quite like that just like to kind of capture the just handmadeness of it just like very subtle thank you you're welcome <laughs> anybody else question
Hi. Um, I was wondering, since you do have such a signature style, if you ever feel sort of held back by that, like you can't explore kind of new styles? Um, for sure. Like for a while, I felt like even though when I started lettering, it was from kind of trying to meld it with my illustration style. But then for a while, I started getting more just like lettering projects, and I was missing doing illustration. And it was like for a while, I was like, I don't know how I can like fit illustration into my lettering. So now I'm like bringing more illustration into my lettering. So I think like I'm playing with more simple kind of letter forms like I did when I started and introducing more illustration uh, into my lettering. But I basically think, while sometimes I'm like, oh, my illustrations are so like, uh, I don't know, playful. And like, if I tried to do something serious, it would be like, oh, come on. Like, <laughs> it doesn't look serious at all. It would just like look like ridiculous and playful, I guess. But I generally just I just like the way that looks and if that's what comes out then I'm happy that it, at least it's always feels like me and like when I'm starting a new project I'm not always like doing something different because I felt even though some people do that and some people do it really well working with different styles but when I started like when I was in design school and I was trying to find my voice as a designer and I was like trying out like really slick styles and I felt it didn't feel like me. It was it was like felt so like odd. It felt uncomfortable. So now I, I mean I at least feel happy that it's like when I do work, it feels like me, and I'm happy with that. But yeah, not so restricted. Just uh, just like branching out very subtly, maybe. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. No more questions. Done. Going once, going twice. Okay. Thank you, Mary Kate. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Coming across the end. Thanks, everybody. That's it. If you could help pick up chairs and put the room back together, that'd be awesome. Hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mary Kate. Thank you. Bye. Bye.